Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn about media art as therapy, when movies and books become treatment. And in this age of COVID-19, when we're being ultra creative in finding ways to satisfy our needs, take care of our mental health, I think this is a particularly a wonderful angle to approach taking care of our mind, body, and spirit from a different perspective. My first guest today is Lisa Bahar, LMFT. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and serves as an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Education and Psychology. Armed with a BA in cinema television production, she enjoys implementing cinema into a therapeutic process known as cinema therapy. Lisa, welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us under very extraordinary circumstances. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. And it's such a pleasure to be here. I know these are unfortunate circumstances and I feel very honored to join the program today and and hopefully inspire the listeners to use the movies or television and the media to create hope and well-being. Amen to that, sister. (laughs) You know, what's interesting is in the past when we've spoken and your work has very much taken the direction of using film and visual media as a passive medium for healing or exploration of one's issues. And you so eloquently described to me before we started our, our interview, kind of a plot twist in your beliefs as as it relates to what's going on with the coronavirus and and media? Well, yes, you're right. Um, And I enjoyed our conversation for the program. And um, the plot twist, as you call it, is actually something where I started to get some insights about how is film actually being used in terms of being helpful to people? Is this becoming something that can potentially, if not is, more harmful than helpful at this time? And how people are finding themselves having to remain quarantined and isolated with film, with television and news outlets, et cetera, and the effects of that on our human psyche, on the psychology of how this is actually something that needs to be questioned, I think, and explored more deeply from a different perspective of how to be more mindful, actually, and be aware of what we're viewing. Well, if we view um, what we are watching in the media as similar to nutrition, the food that we ingest, and if Mm. we are really not being aware of what we're consuming, we end up obese and sick. Right. Wow. Wow. It's a great comparison. I appreciate that. It didn't dawn on me earlier, but then as you were speaking, I'm like, it is about like what we are feeding ourselves. And so many of us are binge watching, even the word binge, right? Right. (laughs) That brings something to mind of sort of a gluttonous experience. Exactly. And so I appreciate what you're saying is about what we're feeding our minds and what we're programming, you know, programs, you switch the channel, switching programs. What programs are you viewing or what programs are you feeding your mind? 
And I yeah. want to just do, like say a disclaimer here. So I'm, I'm going to make myself a little bit of the guinea pig and admit mm-hmm. that I am a, a news junkie. B, mm-hmm. I find the Tiger King to be my spirit animal. And I know that it's probably not good for me. And I'm rooting for him to get a pardon because he's a national treasure. And I, and I say that completely facetiously. And But I, I am consuming stuff that's probably not good. And then on the other hand, I'm consuming stuff that I find so heartwarming and uplifting. That's good, too. Talk to me about that, Lisa. Yeah. What exactly yeah. are you watching that's heartwarming and uplifting? <laughs> and how does that make you feel, Lisa? I like that. <laughs> There's uh, the therapy. Yes, we're having, we are having a therapy session together on the show. <laughs> I have, have watched, and I'm going to highly recommend, and I am no movie critic here, mm-hmm. Unorthodox, because it is ah. the story of a young woman on a heroic journey. Right. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful story. And it's not it's not 100 percent pretty. It's not 100 percent triumphant, but it's 100 percent sort of real and portrays the life of someone trying to find herself or come home to herself. So that was binge worthy. And I felt really good after I consumed that, like not too many calories. You know, it wasn't, you know. <laughs> So that was good. And so I recommend that to you. And the other was a documentary entitled Jacob, which is the story of this like savant genius man who is a doctor, a bioethicist, an author, a certified New York City tour guide. He's just this incredible man that has the capacity for so much. And he's like risen above his own challenges. So again, that theme, that theme is there, right? Mm -hmm. It's like an overcoming theme or the, like we were talking earlier about the Joseph Campbell experience or the hero's journey. These are the kinds of what you're looking at are documentaries, but I'm wondering are documentaries just because they're not fictional or a fantasy can be actually much more profound than actual fantasy at this time. Fantasy serves its purpose to escape as a way to maybe check out and not deal with life, but maybe that's not such in the best interest of our Maybe that's not so healthy right now. Maybe we need to connect with life, real people going through real journeys. And like you said, from unorthodox that are not necessarily happy endings, but people that are overcoming situations, surviving it and having hope that inspires others. I think you're right. And you shared something that really got my attention that when you were in film school at USC, there was a sign above above the door or at the door. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that sign and what it represented to you, because it gave me a little jolt. Well, it's funny because I was thinking about that this morning as I was th- considering how I, what, you know what you and I would be talking about. And there was a there's actually it was a sign. I think it was right above the door of the school at the time. I was there way back in the 90s, early, late 80s. And it said, reality ends here. And during the time when I was in film school, I was always questioning, what does that mean exactly? Reality ends here. Well, where is that where fantasy and imagery and tell a vision, television yeah. comes into play, that we're actually using films to create alternative realities that are not true or is there something to these realities this is what came to my mind today is there something to these realities that have truth to it that we're just not aware of what we're watching and that was the plot twist you were referring to is maybe there's more to movies and cinema on how it is that what we're watching is actually very much a real process of how the psyche or the psychology of the mind can be potentially um, manipulated if we're not mindful of what we're viewing and yeah. not aware of what we're watching. And I, and I, it's a serious twist there, but it's one that I just, um, I just couldn't get off that today. I wanted to talk to you about it and hopefully help the listeners come into a different perspective to contemplate and consider. Well, I think it is worth paying attention to because many of us have really gravitated towards binge watching as a way to cope with our own anxiety, to escape from the news, which has not been very good globally, as well as here in in the States. 
And yet, when we go to these binge watching programs, we're not feeding ourselves. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. It's like, you know, we're, be careful what you eat. You are what you eat. And if we're consuming right. stuff that is dark and sort of tamps down that hopefulness and joy that is in inherent or can be inherent in life and even through difficulties, I, I guess that's where I'm thinking. Like things are very, very hard for many people. There's a lot of uncertainty of financial well-being, their living situations, the health of relatives near and far, concern about one's own health. And I think we need a dose of not only stress inoculation, but a dose of joy. Right. Well, but as you were talking about that, I was thinking about how movies can actually validate fear and anxiety. And that's the part of being mindful about but at the same time, as we're isolated to a certain degree, depending on the region and where you're at and what your life, if it's essential job, and so these are all factors to consider as how far does this go for you personally, how we're actually remaining connected and um, keeping those connections even stronger. So family is now more united in a certain degree. I'm not saying every family is and there's not those problems. But what we're viewing as a family could be relatively different, whether it's the news or whether it's like what you're talking about as some of these more inspirational films or what are we doing here with, are we validating the fear and anger and anxiety by watching movies, by watching programs that strengthen that? Or are we mindful enough? And it's very hard because movies have a way of pulling in the mind to release control. When you get into a movie, it can be a very good film. And one of the telling points of a good film is when you lose yourself in the movie, you forget you're there. Yeah. That's a, that's a sure thing that that's a great movie. On the other hand, being very, very mindful, be very aware of what journey are you taking your mind into and the way movies have evolved with Netflix and like you were talking about the binge watching and the series and I can't get off the series until I'm done. That could be very um, harmful depending on what you're watching. You know, I do know. And as you're talking, the words instant gratification come to mind. And I want to pause mm. there and take the break because I do think a, we're going to make everybody delay their gratification. B, you and I can talk about it at the break and come back with some pithy words about that. To learn more about Lisa Bahar and her work as a cinema therapist, please visit her website, lisabahar.com. On Facebook, she is at Lisa Bahar LMFT. And on Twitter, Lisa underscore Bahar. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. And that is a joyful guarantee. Hang on, listeners of Harvesting Happiness. Before we trot off to the brief pause, I want to share with you my new little fiendish entertainment obsession. Best Fiends is a free downloadable app that is seriously good fun. It's a great way to redirect that busy brain of yours from anxiety and worry to amusing interactive mind play that engages the old noggin in new ways to solve puzzles, collect characters, and compete with people you know and people you don't. For me, it's a little stress relief in the palm of my hand. I spend a few delightful minutes each day to focus my attention on this highly engaging digital universe that challenges my skills. Best Fiends gives my brain a rest from the daily routine and transports me to another colorful realm that is a unique and exciting puzzle experience unlike any other out there in cyberspace. I've been steadily working on rising through the ranks. Right now, I'm at level 435 and steadily climbing. Best Fiends never gets old. Each month, new dynamic content and events are added that will delight your senses. And here's the cool part. Best Fiends can be played anywhere, and you do not need Wi-Fi access or use cellular data to play. Come along and join me in my happy, harmless obsession over at Best Fiends. Engage your brain and focus your mind with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends 
We'll be right back, and that is a promise. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we are back talking about media arts as therapy when movies and books become treatment. Let's get back to the conversation with therapist Lisa Bahar. We're talking about ways that we can take care of ourselves, particularly amidst this COVID-19 crisis. And Lisa has a very interesting perspective. Let's return to that conversation. Lisa, we spoke just prior to the break about the notion of instant gratification and we as humans turning that desire to be pleasured in many aspects of our lives instantaneously, albeit through shopping, gatherings, food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to our media experiences. Yes, we were. And for me, as I was reflecting on what you were saying, it became just a a more significant, actually more obvious form of activating the craving center, activating the addict mind, but also in a highly manipulative way that movies, whatever you're wa- whatever a person is watching, has the potential to actually take on the craving center and lock it into this high, which would be a little dopamine kick or whatever chemical surge might occur with addiction in, in general. But on top of that, it could also combine with, whether it's cross-addicting to maybe a substance or in the reality of what we're looking at um, more and more, in mental health and otherwise is the pornography, violence, because that part of the brain needs, builds a tolerance. You become desensitized. So you want more of a surge. So there's a heightened response to what you need in order to feel engaged, feel like you're getting something out of it, not bored or checking out. What can I watch that can frighten me? What can I watch that will be pornographic? Which is not a, a new problem because of COVID-19. It's actually an existing problem. But I would venture to say that it's accelerating because of the isolation aspect of what human beings are going through right now with regards to a lot of this. I'll stop there. No, I, you brought up something that I had not really thought of about pornography and its visual medium and what it does to a human being and activating, you know, that pleasure center in the brain. But also when we talk about the increase in addiction, the increase in domestic violence, because people are not used to being separated and disconnected as we are right now, I think causes great alarm, at least to me. I think, oh my word, we were not trained to really cope with our distress. Most of us never really learned how to handle extreme conditions like this. Whereas, you know, I think during one of the breaks or prior to us talking, we were talking about various team members that work on this show that live in parts of the world where, and I'm thinking of one of our team members who lives in Caracas, Venezuela, who's She's been living with an oppressive government for years. And she says, oh, we're doing fine. We're doing great because we already know how to do it. We already know how to adapt. We know how to be alone. We just put on our masks and our gloves and we're doing the same thing. So she had the skill set already to handle this. And she's in her late 20s. Bless her heart. Yeah. This is new for Americans. And I like what she said here about coping with distress, that we don't have the tools to do that because this is new territory that what you're describing of what your friend's going through is not very far from what we're being asked to do. Yeah. And the other thing we were talking about is that when you look at the economic situation in the United States today, and so many people have lost their jobs, so many people are having a hard time just keeping the roof over their heads and food on their table. But I would venture to guess that they're finding a way to pay that internet bill. So they've got cable service. (laughs) (laughs) That's the last to go. Right. right? To yeah. get that drug, to get, you know, to get the fix. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> to be That's able to binge. Dealer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because what would they do yeah. otherwise? 
You know what's interesting, Lisa, is as you were talking, I just wanted, I do a lot of group therapy with um, using the DBT skills. I pull in some of the cinema in there, but I just wanted to say this about a younger generation of clients that I was talking to that were probably in the age range of 18 to 22. And I found it fascinating that they were angry about what they were expressing was, I am angry that I can't get away from my cell phone. I'm angry that my mom and dad say, you know, you need to go out there and play and have fun and do some stuff outside, put your cell phone down and how hard that is. They were actually, I thought it was a fascinating conversation. It happened last week that I wasn't expecting them to say that they feel very tied into the conditioning of their brain to the media, to the cell phone, to watching Netflix, to watching social media that they can't stop checking the social media, for example, or watching whatever it is that they're watching that is constantly using the media and visuals to infiltrate their brains that they can't, it's difficult to even concentrate and maintain focus that they need an external drug to help them do that. Um, So I thought that was interesting in terms of movies, cinema, media, and social media of how the younger generation seems to be getting a little uh, wise in this. They have an awareness about it and not something that I would expect from them. I just thought I would throw that out there and, and see where you go with that in regards to the context of instant gratification and coping with distress and how media can potentially be manipulating based on how it's hijacking our brain, so to speak. And at the same time, what is it that we're feeding our brain through this? Well, you know, it makes me think of an episode of 60 Minutes that was aired. I believe it was aired in 2018. I might be wrong. It was so popular. It was, uh, I think, aired two or three times that year. And it was on uh, brain hacking. And it was about companies like Google and what they do when they develop programming, you know, software programming and and how Google is really seeking to tap into that brainstem and grab us. They are doing it with psychology. They're doing it with technology and psychology, which is knowing that we as humans want instant gratification. We love our pleasure. We're pleasure seeking missiles by wiring and then playing to that. And I think what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. It was, it was actually not what I was thinking before we started talking, but now that we're, we're into it, I'm like, Yes, we have got a, a great opportunity to do a little digital detoxing here and like implement some neuroplasticity. Right. <laughs> You're right. Teach us so all. <laughs> that, I love that. Digital <laughs> detox. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And reconnect with media in a way that is positive and nurturing and serving. I mean, you mentioned that um, you had done work for the Hallmark Network at one time and you found their programming was not always Pollyanna. I mean, there, there were stories of, of, of heart and struggle, and maybe this is what we need more of. That's right. And I think it's out there, but right now maybe, and the awareness factor is to be mindful of what is it that is actually happening right now in our films? What are we seeing recreated in the world as we know it? Here's a telling sign, Lisa, is movies have a way of snapshotting our future. So what we're seeing now has not been unusual for film and television to depict through the medium, that this isn't new. There's been movies made about this. Yes. And isn't that interesting that people have written about such things prior to things happening? And how does that happen? Well, that's a whole other discussion of how does this, who's in charge of what is actually being produced and being put out there for us to view is a whole other exploration, Um, maybe an expose, if you will. But um, just being aware as a a human being, if you want to call it a consumer or just somebody who's out there, question what you're looking at, question reality. That's the value we have of being aware of what you were talking about earlier is taking control of our own minds and being able to notice what we're looking at and being able to question it and also noticing, I'm going to do a little bit of a reach here, the collective aspect of what we're going through as a nation, as a globe, as a, as a human race is similar, and I'm going to make a, a dialectical shift here, to fandoms 
you know, how fandoms can get mesmerized by a certain character or a certain show, an artist that's singing. What exactly are they singing that's creating these incredible attachments with such high intensity? Or what exactly are we watching that is creating this intensity and this attachment that we actually go through these deep emotions of when somebody dies in the fo- on the program or goes off the program, we have these deep attachments to these characters that is worthy of questioning, of just uh, being able to lift the veil, if you will, of what exactly are you going through here that is causing such an intense reaction and maybe testing that by taking, like you said, a digital detox of Taking a step back, what are the symptoms of that? Are you going through agitation, irritability, or difficulty concentrating? This might be an addiction. This might be an instant gratification problem that the brain needs some holistic health. And like what you're talking about is create your own movie by creating a new way of looking at life and what you're feeding yourself to create your reality out there that might not be so in line with what others are telling you to think through the media. Yeah. And which, you know, we talked about sort of these Zoom gatherings and people really are creating these events. I know that I have attended a couple of uh, daybreakers. I don't know if you know what those are, but Radha Agrawal is an author and the co-founder of daybreakers. And these are early morning rave parties that occur around the world. They are drug and alcohol free. I think they start at five or six in the morning and they go till about eight or nine. And in this climate, she's moved these daybreakers online. So every Saturday for two hours, people can commune from all over the world and get two hours of soul, brain and body food with breathing and Mm. mindfulness and dancing and communing and recognizing that we are not alone. We're, We're separated, but we're not alone. That's right. I love that. I love that. Me too. It's amazing how people can connect. It's funny how something can seem like, oh, this is going to disconnect people. And I say, and yet look at the persistence and the perseverance of the human spirit. People will connect. You can't stop them. (laughs) And in such an inspiring and different ways. And I think the outcome of this is going to be very hopeful in that what, how we connect and how we do it is going to have a unique, like you say, plot twist but it's going to be inspiring. I think it's good for us in a weird way, what we're going through, unfortunately. And and maybe there's a silver lining that's here that deserves to maybe just be talked about too, is, you know, maybe this is a good thing for us. Maybe we can connect in ways that are a lot more healthier and real and come out of our bubbles and really question our question reality and start a new way of, of, of interacting And I think movies can enhance that and wanting to see movies that really inspire that, um, like documentaries, like you described, or the Hallmark Hall of Fame used to make these movies that, you know, had films that were very heartwarming, went through distress, got through it, overcame things, but it wasn't always a happy ending, but it was a hopeful ending. Right. And life isn't always a happy ending. And I think it's what we do with those unhappy endings or those challenging endings, you know, to rebound and create something of meaning out of it that becomes, I think, the challenge for all of us right now. I mean, we're in it together. We're separated, but we're in it together. And, you know, as you were talking, you know, four other words came to mind and I wrote them down because it was about critical thinking, discernment and agency. Mm, I like it. And I think what you are sharing challenges us to really employ those three things, you know, to um, discern a little bit what's good for us versus not good for us in terms of the um, the media diet that we're consuming, to have agency over the things that we watch or ingest, you know, which gives us a sense of control and empowerment. You know, we feel very right. out of control right now, which is sending us to consume carbohydrates, right? Quick right? energy fixes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so b- by sort of employing that agency, we take some power back. And then the critical thinking part to me is about the what's next, the hopefulness. How right. do we create the hopefulness for ourselves? I like it. 
And then we're probably out of time, but we'll go over for a minute or two more. And I, I was reading about um, what this period of time has been called the great pause, you know, that we're in the great pause. And I mm-hmm. believe where we're headed, or at least I'm practicing for myself, that I'm headed in the direction of the great reset. I like it. There's the silver lining. There is a little bit of joy or a little bit of light that gets in through that crack. <laughs> you know, cr- there Absolutely. is the crack in the darkness. There is. Lisa, there come is. back and hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, Lisa. We're going to do Lisa. Lisa, Lisa, and the cult jam. <laughs> that, that was remember a, that? Oh I do remember God. that. To learn more about the fabulous work of Lisa Bahar, we're talking about cinema therapy. Please visit lisabahar.com. On Facebook, she is at Lisa Bahar, L-M-F-T. And on Twitter, Lisa underscore Bahar. <laughs> that was so good. I'm so glad we did this, Lisa. We'll be right back. That's a promise. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. about media arts as therapy when movies and books become treatment. My next guest is Dr. Jenny Ogden, and she's got some interesting things to say about bibliotherapy. Who knew by reading a book prescribed for us about a specific issue, we could actually help heal that issue. Let's join that conversation. Before becoming a fiction writer, she was a researcher and taught clinical psychology and neuropsychology at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. She holds several doctoral degrees, including zoology and neuropsychology. Her debut novel was entitled A Drop in the Ocean. Her next novel due out this year is The Moon is Missing. Jenny, welcome to the show. And I am really excited to talk with you about bibliotherapy, which many of us in the States do not know about. Oh, kia ora, Lisa. It's lovely to be here. Kia ora is New Zealand's hello. <laughs> so kia ora. A kia ora. Um, <laughs> kia ora. Kia ora. Well, it's, it is very nice to be here. And I um I would like to say to start off with I'm not myself a bibliotherapist. That's a sort of very specialist area of therapy. But I do know a bit about it, and I can tell you about that. But in broader term, I'm really interested in how books can help us through any times, and especially times like this. And I like to think of um, back in the 70s, New Zealand had a prime minister, Norman Kirk, who was a very popular prime minister, and he said something that's become a bit of a a thing in New Zealand. He said that once New Zealanders don't want much, just someone to love, somewhere to live, something to do and something to hope for. And I think think that's right, actually, for all people, not just New Zealanders, obviously. And I think that in this time when we're all stuck in our, in New Zealand we call them our bubbles, we're all stuck in our bubbles, self-isolating or in, in lockdown as we are here. We have been thrown back to the basics of how we can have a content life in this restricted time. And I think reading books can help us with all of those four things that that Prime Minister back then said we needed for contentment. So the obvious one is that reading, of course, it gives us something to do. But often it can also help us with the someone to love because how many of us read a book novel in particular and fall in love with the characters mm. or find them intriguing and they you know and so that can stop us being so lonely that can make us happy for a time and I think we can say that part of reading is the someone to love it's also a book and books throughout history have given us something to hope for there have been one one means of making us think more deeply about the future and how it could be better Even somewhere to live could encompass books because, you know, if you're in a busy bubble, as we have, or a busy household, we have, say, two or three or four people in it, and you're locked down together, it can get a little bit overwhelming at times. And one of the things you can do, if you, depending on how big your house is, you can find yourself a space that is specifically that you can have a quiet time for reading in. 
and you know, can have turns with the other people in the household, or if it's a small space, you can even just have a comfy chair in the corner of a room. And when you're in that chair or someone else's, you don't interrupt them, and they can use that chair for. In my case, it would be reading. It might be listening to their music. It might be creating. So I think that even somewhere to live in a small way can encompass that idea of how books can help us. I want to go to the something to hope for also, but I just want to tap into the somewhere to live because really it transports us to an ideal setting in some ways, depending upon what we choose to read, we're completely taken out of a uh, circumstance and placed into somewhere else that might be more pleasant. Absolutely. That's another and even better way to think of somewhere to live. I think absolutely. Yes. And my um, first novel, A Drop in the Ocean, one of the reasons I think it did so well was it transported people to our remote coral island on the Great the, the Great Barrier Reef, where there were turtles and a very small eccentric population, and that was actually the whole point of it. And indeed, that's exactly what it does. It transports us to somewhere special. And when we talk about the context of bibliotherapy, and I know you're not a bibliotherapist, but you you know a bit about it. You wrote an article for Psychology Today, which I think is how producer Andrea found you. And I'd love for you to talk about that blog and and the uh, actual scope of bibliotherapy. Yes, it's very interesting. It's fascinating, really. Well, we've got a home library here, and uh, above the door, I have a little wooden plaque with a quote from Cicero, who you know lived at, like you know 100 years before Christ, and he and it says, "If you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need." Mm. And a thousand years before Christ, King Ramses the Second of Egypt apparently had a special chamber for his books, and above the door were the words "House of Healing for the Soul." So this this thing about books being a healing and therapeutic thing have been around a very, very long time. And more more recently, not that recently, but Sigmund Freud you certainly used reading materials as part of a psychoanalysis. And since then, as a clinical psychologist, I used to give my clients reading matter all the time. Sometimes it would be a sort of a self-help book. Sometimes it would be articles on whatever they had wrong with them and so on. But that is is different from this thing called bibliotherapy. Those self-help books and just educating yourself about your issue, your problem, your depression, your whatever it is, is one thing, but bibliotherapy goes a step further. That is when bibliotherapy and the books are actually used as, as the therapy. This is the therapeutic method. So, in fact, you can... The way bibliotherapists do it is once that they have worked out what books are going to be therapeutic for you, you don't need to go to your therapist anymore. You can just read your books. You spend all that money on getting books. What a good idea. And reading them. Oh. <laughs> so this is what happens in, in That's amazing. <laughs> yes, well, well, apparently it's been around since 1916 when someone in the States first brought that word in, bibliotherapy. And then recently, I think it's had a resurgence. And Alan de Botton's got a an institution in London called the School of Life, and he has got three, I think, bibliotherapists as part of that School of Life, and they do bibliotherapy consults. And anyone can get one of those consults by online. Actually, I mean, I haven't done that, but you know, some one of your listeners might want to. And what they do is they first interview you. And find out your relationship with books. You know, how are books important to you? Where do you read them? What sort of books do you really you'd love? And so on. So they do this very in-depth in- interview. And then they do an interview about your current, if you like, psychological issues or health, you know, mental health issues or whatever it is. Or you might be about to retire and you're worried about it. You might be redundant. You might be in isolation. Or you might, your marriage might be in trouble. Same sorts of things. So they do that and then they go away and they have read, they must have read thousands of books and they pick out a whole list of books that they believe will help you find out more about your issue and how you might deal with it. So perhaps a a simple example, if your marriage is in in trouble, they might prescribe you some books about marriage with different outcomes and different ways of approaching it and so on and so forth. And there are books that the characters are dealing with everything you can possibly think of. So that's what they do. 
And then, you know, they give you that list of books and then you go away and you pick them out and you read them. And, and of course, you don't read them fast. You read them slowly and you think about them. And apparently that can be incredibly therapeutic. So that's why bibliotherapy is and how it is different from just self-help books. That's fascinating. I mean, it sounds to me like it's a bit of a vicarious or voyeuristic view of a parallel issue that one might have and then seeing the way others solve the problem or not and then relating it back to the self. Yes, that's right. But the other thing I think is that, especially when you're reading novels, when we read novels and novels, these the bibliotherapists tend to prescribe novels, not nonfiction, because novels have a very different effect on us when you're reading them than, than nonfiction does. When you're reading a novel, it, we, you know, there's even been some studies, not brilliant studies, but there have been studies that show that our brains are become in tune with the things that are happening on in the novel. So people who read novels, there have been studies that show they are more empathetic generally. And so huh. and because in a novel you've got to get in to the character's head and feel as they do if you you know it's a good book. And so that's why novels have that extra therapeutic flavor because you are actually living in that world of that character. Ah, so one is stepping out of self, the ego, putting their self in someone else's shoes, thereby activating compassion and empathy for the character, which perhaps minimizes or normalizes your one's own struggles. Absolutely. That's well put. And the other thing about those stories is that they allow us to experience worlds and and events that we never have experienced in our lives ourselves. And it's a rehearsal. This is a lot of psychologists believe this and think this, that the whole point of why people love stories and have done over way back, you know, always people have been drawn to stories, people's stories, is because this is a way they can rehearse how they are going to behave in the future themselves if they should ever get into a situation similar to that. So they learn from these other stories by being really part of them, by empathizing with the people in them, by crying with the characters, laughing with the characters. And then that particular situation happens to them down the track. They have already rehearsed it to some extent. And that is why people think that novels have been so important all in all of human history, really. That is truly fascinating. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I just want to clarify the difference between self-help and nonfiction and go back to why specifically this works. Just to recap, but let's take that break first to learn more about Jenny Ogden's work and her books, A Drop in the Ocean, which is the newest novel that's coming out, as well as her debut, The Moon is Missing. Please visit JennyOgden.com. On Facebook, you can find her at Jenny Ogden Books. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H-Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. about media art as therapy with my guest today, Dr. Jenny Ogden. Let's get back to the conversation about the interesting topic of bibliotherapy. 
Jenny, prior to the break, you were talking about the specificities of bibliotherapy, and you gave an example of the School of Life, where there are bibliotherapists in residence who will prescribe even online after an evaluation period. Talk about, just go back for one second and describe the difference between being given or suggested a novel, a fictional novel to read versus saying, okay, I'm depressed. I'm going to go take a self-help book on depression or anxiety or grief. Okay. Yes, I will. Well, well, self-help books definitely have a place, no doubt about that. And for example, when I was a you know a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist, I would often give my clients uh, either, depending who they were or what uh, article was about. For example, I worked a lot with people with neuropsychology, head injury, and so on and so forth, or self-help books to help them get on the strategies of that we practice perhaps in the in the clinic. But the function of the self-help books is much more direct and practical. And some of them do often provide exercises, of course, that we do as we go along, which is are useful. And some even take us deeper into our psyche, some of these self-help books. And so that can be certainly seen as part of our therapy. But the point is they don't allow us entry into the lives of other people in the same way as a novel or indeed a memoir, but which, of course, although that's non-fiction, it's very personal story. And this means that they don't directly stimulate our imaginations and our emotions. And sometimes having our imaginations and our emotions stimulated is exactly what we need. So when we read fiction, this does it for us in a much more emotionally nuanced way and often a much more pleasurable way, of course. Apart from pure escapism, which is something we all need when we're perhaps stressed out. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes, research has shown that reading other people's stories increases our emotional understanding of people different from ourselves or different views from ourselves and allows us to experience worlds. It, you know, they might they be very realistic worlds or they might be pure fantasy that we otherwise couldn't experience, but it all gets that imagination working. And... Um, and I think that's that's what's important. But then again, of course, we have the the situation of those books that are prescribed for you are ones that are the the bibliotherapists who really know their literature think will make you start thinking much more deeply about the issues that you are currently experiencing, not in a surface superficial way, but really getting into it. And perhaps it's a cathartic process. And if you are reading a novel about a protagonist who you can really empathize with, who is experiencing the same problems as you and who is deeply uh, depressed and it's expressed in that novel or that perhaps a memoir, the empathy of that person can open up for you those same emotions, which couldn't be opened up before. And it might be that you start crying for that the, the person in the, in the novel for them, but then it becomes for you. So, you know, you might start by weeping for the character in that story, but we're also weeping for ourselves. And it's like a sort of catharsis even. And then hopefully if that character finds happiness in the end, we think, oh, perhaps we can do that too. So that's a very simplistic example of, of how this might work. And, and, of course, there are many, many books that the, the bibliotherapist prescribes. So you're getting different things from each one. Why do you feel it's more important that we read fiction rather than watch Netflix? And there's nothing wrong with watching Netflix, but you're saying that for um, meaning or value that books give us something that movies don't. I do think they do, but then, of course, I do tend to be a bit biased. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> although, I, having said that, I watch heaps of Netflix. I think... Any stories are good, whether that you're reading them or on or they're on Netflix. There is, and so do the lot, do the lot, whatever. But the act of reading it make you know we have to use our imaginations when we're reading a novel because the book does not tell us everything. The, in fact, books, novels that have too much detail are boring. What we read a novel for is so that we can imagine how that person looks and feels and sounds 
And we can imagine the place that they are in. When we're watching Netflix, it's all there. You know, we do not have to use our imagination. It's all right in front of us. Doesn't mean we're not on the edge of our seat, but we don't have that deep thinking process going on where our imagination is soaring and working, you know, and doing a lot of the uh, of thinking about what's going on here. And also when you're reading, it's at your own pace. You can stop and pause and think about it. And this is one thing I think people don't do enough when they're reading. When you're reading a novel, you don't want to whiz through it. You know, you want to stop and think about it. And you can't do that with Netflix. In fact, we binge on Netflix. We can't even wait for the next episode. That's true. <laughs> and, and, but that, and that's fine, but it's a different, it has a lot of differences. And I think that pace, going at our own speed, gives us time to think more deeply about the issues raised by the story. So, and also that empathy tends to be much stronger, you know, and the studies have shown that people who read novels tend to be more empathetic. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned that. And I find that fascinating. And the thing that also comes to mind by what you're describing is that when we're reading that novel that completely engrosses us, and I've experienced this several times myself where I've got, you know, a very thick, long novel, and I find myself slowing down to savor it, like I don't want it to end. I want to remain in that world. It's kind of euphoric. That's the best novel, isn't it? Yes. That's the best novel. Yes, it is. And, you know, I've often thought, oh, this is just my own strange thinking, you know, meditation is a big thing, right? Yes. Meditation and getting into yoga and and wonderful thing. But, you know, not everyone meditates. You will know this, of course, because this is your area, but the, the, it's mindful, you know, this mindfulness business of being in the moment. So mindfulness is, as you know, very, well, of course, you know, it's very major in positive psychology, being mindful. And people have different ways of being mindful. And for me, being mindful is being so engrossed in the moment that there's no time. Time just is not meaningful. And that can happen when you're completely engrossed in a novel. You know, yeah. I think that's a form of my, you know, of being mindful, which is, a, you know, a very healthy thing to be to be to completely engrossed and time just disappears. And look at right now, we're all in self-isolation and locked in. Yeah. We have the time and we don't have to feel guilty about it. That's been one of the best parts of this whole thing. You know, I find myself reading uh, for pleasure as opposed to reading for the show or for clients or, you know, to, you know, read the latest books to keep on, on top of things academically. So there's been a lot of pleasure in that. And I think other people report the same thing. Absolutely. I've heard, especially where we live on a remote island, <laughs> people are loving it. Um, we, we're remote anyway. We don't have many people here. But, but even here, it's even better because you don't feel you have to be out there doing something. And I hope that we learn from this. And I was talking to my son last night, who's a very busy, busy, busy person normally, and he's loving this, even though he's lost a lot of money and he's got a small business. He said, oh, I hope I learn from this and that I have learned that I don't have to be so busy. Yes. Busy, busy, busy. And I hope that a lot of people learn that. I hope so too. I mean, that is the silver lining um, that comes from a difficult situation. Without going to a bibliotherapist, how can we find books that will add more to our lives than just simple entertainment or escapism? What are some tips you can give us what to look for when before we pick up that book? Well, it's hard. I mean, everyone is unique, of course, and their issues are unique and their loves of, of, of the sort of books they like are unique. But I would think that if you are a, a reader already, and you probably are if you're listening to this, I mean, perhaps in this situation of lockdown, if you don't belong, I mean, recommendations and reviews are how I find books. Um, and if you uh, don't belong on a book club, or even if you do, perhaps you're doing those online because you tend to be with a group of people, and it's lovely discussing books, isn't it? You tend to be with a group of people who have, are like-minded. So, But if you're not on a book club, why don't you start one up? Start one online. Start with a small group of like-minded friends. And that's one way of finding new books. 
you know, that you hadn't thought of before. I would use Goodreads. I would use, I mean, it's not really any different. It's just that perhaps thinking about the books you want, you might have a wider lens to think about the books you need to, you might find something more than just a good entertaining read from. I would really use some of those and see if I can find uh, some of these wonderful book reviewers that review books that fit with your what you think and I would challenge myself to go outside my normal things I like to read my normal genre and read you know more widely I think that's a really good suggestion for myself I tend to read nonfiction, and so when I come across a good fiction book I'm always delighted Because it's so different. You know, I'm completely transported. The thinking mind goes off and I can bring myself to flow state. It's not just mindfulness, but it is that flow where time and space are gone and you feel really good and just in it. And it feels very juicy, you know, very present. Yes. And I think also if you're a big novel reader, then it's also good to go to some nonfiction. Yes. You know, it's not quite the same empathy thing, but it can be. And you and I were just talking before we started this about a book, books we've each been just started to read, both of which are nonfiction, but about, you know, um, about um, war situations, in fact, and, and people's experiences in those wars. And those books, of course, can be incredibly fascinating, but teach us so much about this situation is terrible that we're in now, but there are many, many more, much more terrible situations people have been in and got through and come out stronger at the other end. And that can also be very important right now to keep things in perspective here. Yes, I have felt that I'm receiving lessons in resiliency by what I'm reading and that the contrast of the difficulties of this nonfiction book that I'm reading is, um, you know, heightening my awareness. The contrast heightens the awareness. So what we're going through now, yes, it's uncomfortable, it's scary, but it will pass and hopefully we'll be better for it. The example that you and I, we were just talking briefly before this, and you said you were just starting to read this particular book, and I wrote it down, and I shall buy it within seconds of leaving this. And I told you a book I just bought and started reading, and yes. you will do the same. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, this, yep. this is how we get books that really speak to us. And we won't like them all. And I always like to say, if you get a book and you've researched it and you think this, you'll like this book, at least give it 50 pages before you throw it away. Because there are thousands of books in the world and you don't want to waste your time on a book that is not engaging you after 50 pages. That's what I think. I absolutely agree. Jenny Ogden, thank you for yourself and bibliotherapy with us today to learn more about Jenny Ogden's work and her books, The Moon is Missing, which will be her newest published this year, and the debut novel, A Drop in the Ocean. Please visit JennyOgden.com on Facebook, Jenny Ogden Books. And thank you for coming from New Zealand to here with me for this period of time and sharing a little joy, even in quarantine. And uh, good luck with with reemergence in New Zealand. (laughs) Thank you for having me, as we say. (laughs) It's been lovely to uh, join you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen and my guests today, Lisa Bahar, LMFT, and Dr. Jenny Ogden, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Go out and rock your day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay joyful. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.